Hi, this is Peter Friedrich, and today we're speaking with Dr. Insha Malik about the Kashmir issue. So Dr. Malik, I want to welcome you here, and I want to thank you for offering your time and being willing to express your opinions and your perspectives about what's happening in Kashmir, which is where you're from. Can you, can you briefly tell us about yourself? Um, hi, Peter. Thank you so much for having me. And this is an important opportunity for me to speak up about uh, where I come from. Uh, so I was born and raised in Kashmir um, up until I was 20, and that's when I left Kashmir. So I have lived through uh, one of the most dangerous militarizations of the place. So I know how it works in the everyday life through, through a personal experience of living through it. And then I am a P I mean, I have a PhD in political theory and gender studies. So I did my work and research on Kashmir. I looked at the role of women and their agency in the resistance politics. So tracing the resistance movement of Kashmir back to somewhere before pre-colonial times, which is um, kind of articulating it in the parallel consciousness of uh, the Kashmiri struggle against the Dogra ruler who was installed by the British. So I, I look at a very, a very long tradition of resistance, which is historical in nature, through my PhD work, which was ethnographic. And I ended up uh, writing a book from the same research, which was published by Paul Gregor Macmillan earlier this year. Uh, and currently, I am working on a couple of other research projects which have to do with uh, understanding conflict, uh, politics of mourning in Afghanistan and Kashmir. And I'm currently based in Afghanistan where I teach at a private university, um, Kardan University, and I'm teaching international relations and uh, political theory in general. So, Dr. Malik, can you uh, briefly share from your perspective what has happened in Kashmir over the past couple of weeks, and especially how is it different from what's been happening in general over the past several decades of conflict there? So, what what is the paradigm shift in how India has been dealing with Kashmir? Um, first of all, we need to clarify, is not just about that there was a special status for Kashmiris, which was revoked overnight, and now somehow Kashmiris are not special anymore. I think this is a very wrong narrative, because when we are looking at Kashmir with that special status, what we're looking at is a horrific record of human rights abuses, a horrific record of violation of civil liberties, a horrific record of, uh, you know, taking away of political and social rights of people to discuss about their collective political future, which is already happening up until this moment. We have enormous documentation from human rights organizations, from people who have done their research on Kashmir, pointing out that Kashmir has been under a group of a sort of de facto occupation because there was so much of militarization already. So, it's not simply a moment of revocation of a special status, but a sort of out and out acceptance that we are going to keep this territory through a, a probable or a kind of out, out and out annexation and complete merger and control by the military. So, in terms of like the technicalities, this is this is what has happened on ground for Kashmiris. Um, and, and why is it so much more dangerous is because earlier we did have some form of local governance where Kashmiri administration was wedged between the overall agenda of the Indian government to completely take away or annex this territory and the Kashmiri people who were adamant on asking their right to self-determination. So we had a sort of buffer in between. Not to say this was a buffer which was pro-people or they kind of respected people's rights. Absolutely not, because a lot of these administrations, uh, including you know, the National Conference Administration or the People's Democratic Party Administration, have an open record of killing uh, peaceful civilians, protesters, 
in uh, different uprisings that have happened ever since 2009, 2008. So in 2010 alone, under Omar Abdullah's regime, we saw more than 170 boys being shot dead uh, point blank by the Indian army. And not a single one of those cases uh, got any justice. So when we're talking about the rampant existence of lack of justice, it's alarming because if you look at Afghanistan, so many of US army personnel have been regularly persecuted for conducting or, or doing crimes against normal civilians. But this has not happened in, in the case of Kashmir and Indian army. There's not a single case of persecution so far. And so if can, now- If I can interject speaking as an American, yeah. as you've mentioned, many, uh, U.S. military personnel have been prosecuted for committing crimes against Afghani civilians. Now, of course, this is the United States, which is thousands and thousands of kilometers away from Afghanistan and has no border with it, and Afghanistan is not a part of the United States, and yet still military personnel have been prosecuted. In the case of, in the case of India and Kashmir, Kashmir is, uh, is uh, administered by India, and these people, they have Indian citizenship. It borders on India, and yet still no Indian Army military personnel have been prosecuted for crimes or atrocities against Kashmir, uh, Kashmiri civilians. Absolutely right. Sometimes we do come to these high profile cases um, on the pretext that army told them we'll give you some jobs and they were killed and brought back as militants who were being who were being shot at and so the case unfolded while they were not militants they were just taken by the army for a simple like a day labor job and they were killed because the army personnel wanted their ranks to be increased so this is this is a dangerous precedent it 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 was something that was talked about and despite of all the you know all the all the media attention this case got, we still didn't go anywhere. So, and, and in many other cases, if you follow human rights violation cases for years, they have fought in the civilian courts and when they are very close to delivering justice, the army would take the court, the, the case to the army court. And then you would never hear back what happens. So absolutely, there's not been a single persecution of the violence that has been committed against Kashmiri civilians, even before the, 370 article revocation. And now what this moment actually does is it uh, takes away the veneer of being a some sort of democratic setup. You know, it, it takes away the veneer of on the basis of which the Indian government would justify denying Kashmiri right to self-determination by saying, well, they have their own government and they can do whatever they want. They have that autonomy which is not true because what these governments or what these sub subsequent uh, administrations ended up doing is administering the Indian will, right? This is how Kashmiris will view it. But they ended up administering Kashmir in a way that was more suitable to New Delhi. And also their control over many other affairs of how uh, to deal with the protests, how to deal with civil liberties, how to deal with freedom of expression was overridden by the army rules. So we're talking about more than 500,000 um, army personnel that were stationed already in Kashmir. So what were they doing? It's not a it's not, it's not a picnic spot out there and everyone is going there. So they were patrolling um, regular civilian lives while it's an army that is designed to fight regular wars, but they, they were just stationed against common civilians. So, uh, so it was already a very terrible uh, situation. And now taking it out of the equation has actually proven a lot of us scholars and activists right that Indian government is not serious about treating Kashmiri people with the same um, with, with the same set of uh, principles that it would like to treat, treat its own people. And then now this revocation has completely taken that that when you're off and it has exposed Kashmiris to sort of outright um, colonialism of Indian state, where the only discussion is, well, you know, it was the Article 370 was discriminatory because you couldn't buy land in Kashmir. And then 
and then also that there wasn't enough development. And all of these things have been actually discussed even by a lot of uh, Indian activists and Indian scholars who have shown that even despite despite of being under an occupation and being such a terrible conflict for more than 60 years, Kashmir fared so much better on many, many indicators than uh, the neighboring states. So what it also shows us is that from, that from this moment on, what we are faced with is a sort of majoritarian political will uh, administered through the right-wing Hindu forces who think they can decide for Kashmir minus the will of Kashmiri people. So that's what I refer to as the abject dehumanization of Kashmiris, where you say they don't have a say in anything that happens to their country or their land because they are somehow not human enough to have that political will or that social expression that can decide the collective future of them as a people. So that's, that's very, very dangerous predicament. So I'd like to ask you, Dr. Malik, as, as you've stated, Kashmir is no small landmass. It's roughly the same size as the United Kingdom. And yet, as you've also pointed out, uh, as have many other people, it is perhaps the most militarized zone in the world. Now, how many troops are actually in Kashmir? I, I believe you referenced a figure of about 500,000 just now. And how does this troop presence impact a person's ability to lead a normal day-to-day -day life in Kashmir? Uh, so uh, if we go back to 2010 and there are several um, think tanks in Delhi, for example, the Observers Research Foundation, which has quoted sometimes the figures to be almost equal to 700,000. So what I'm estimating is roughly between 500 to 700,000. And then you can add up all the additional military, military build up that has happened since the August 4th, like since this recent move by the Indian government. So the presence of military is unprecedented. It's huge. And um, I can say this from my own experience of growing up there is that it, you don't feel safe in your own house because your lanes are patrolled by people who are clearly not uh, one of you. There are people who are different from you in terms of uh, religion, in terms of uh, ethnicity, in terms of uh, the lands and regions that they come from. So they instill a lot of fear by their very presence. But also then the things that have happened over the period of time since the uprising, it was, uh, since the armed uprising in 1989, you see this um, all out control of civilian life, uh, human rights abuse, like in terms of taking away people on mere suspicion or shooting them down on mere suspicion because there are these articles that support them like ASPA, which is Armed um, Forces Special Powers Act that gives the Indian Army right to shoot anyone on mere suspicion. And you have Public Safety Act, again, something that allows, uh, that allows the Indian administration to, sorry, that allows the Indian administration to actually um, arrest anyone for up to five years without bail. Um, so there are a lot of draconian laws in addition to what that military presence means in the, in the everyday civilian lives that creates a kind of very complex um, situation for civilians in Kashmir. Um, and then we have, uh, since 2008, when the mass uprising in a peaceful manner, again, it, it started and people were asking that what we are demanding is right to self-determination. And then what we have seen as a response from the Indian state is again unprecedented oppressive tactics against very young the age group of 11 to 22. These are you know people who actually come out or who felt stoned because they are angry at the presence of the civil arresting them and putting them behind the bars on very draconian law with, with support of draconian laws like Public Safety Act or um, 
and, and some such. So what it has also done is that there's absolute fear for the young people, for the people in the age group of 11 to 22, because they are, they are the potential resistors or the potential uh, people who are um, in, in contravention with the Indian state at this moment. I mean, I'm talking about something before the revocation of Article 370. So this is already what was happening there. And now we can only assume that after this moment, these people are going to feel further up against the wall. You know, they've been pushed to the wall and they, they feel more and more that they don't have any voice to register what they are feeling for living in Kashmir right now. Um, so it's a level of militarization where uh, you you necessarily don't uh, you, you you don't feel that you are part of the system you feel that you have to every day prove yourself to be a human being you be on you military industrial complex as well because a lot of land is under army so orchards and cultivatable land which is taken away by army so a lot of people do fear that uh, you know their livelihoods are directly ch challenged by such militarization as well um, so what we're talking about is already very very grave and very very intense for everyday common Kashmiris. Um, and with this revocation, what the fear is that now it will not be only the army that will clash with the Kashmiris, but it will also be the administration or the so-called civilian uh, garb of the Indian state that will come all out against them. And as we have seen, like with the with the member parliaments or BJP spokespersons and different political parties and states saying, you know, as if Kashmiris are, you know, just commodities that we can go and marry white or fair Kashmiri women, or we can go and buy land. So the discussion is no longer about what will happen to Kashmiri people, but it's more about what can we get, what can we grab, what, what can we have. So the dangerous predicament is there's a majoritarian sentiment which is pitched now against a very small minority who are pretty much defenseless um, because now also that any sort of political institutions any sort of political representation is behind bars they are muted there's a communication blackout so no one can speak for them um, and it and and the silence is almost deafening because everyone else, as you rightly said in the beginning, that everyone is talking about Kashmiri, Kashmir, except Kashmiris. And so that's the, that's the danger of uh, what, it, what it's pointing towards is that increasingly this dehumanization of Kashmiris will make it absolutely okay and normal to uh, actually get away and kill all of these people. And that's the danger of fascism that we're talking about right now. Yeah. So in relation to this term that you're using about dehumanization, and you've written in the past that, let me quote you, that if there's anything I want you to take away from this, it's the alarming theme of dehumanization. So in relation to, to that issue, I also want to bring in something else that you've talked about in the past, which is, and let me again quote you, in Kashmir, for the entire conflict, women have always been out there fighting. So I want to, and then in addition to that, you've also written that the conflict has actually proven to be more brutal for women. So keeping these things in mind in the issue of dehumanization, I want to ask you, Dr. Malik, what is the role of women in the conflict in Kashmir? And how has the conflict proven to be more brutal for them? Uh, so as we already know that sexual violence is sort of used as, as a popular theme for shaming the enemy community. If in the overall polity of Indian polity, Kashmiris are deemed as traitors, 
then automatically what is happening is that Kashmiri women are seen as the spoils of war. And when that happens, it's, it's very dangerous because um, automatically the feeling is that either they need to be protected or saved. You know, these are themes we have also seen in wars elsewhere where um, governments from other countries decide that we need to attack another country because we need to save their women. So if that's the popular imagination, then saving of women or collecting them or trading them or thinking of them as spoils of war are common themes that can, you know, that we face with. Now, if we look at the theme of sexual violence and militarization in Kashmir, and we go back like 10 years, 12 years, um, Indian Army has regularly perpetrated rape and sexual assault on not just Kashmiri women, but also on Kashmiri men. So sexual violence as a tool of war, as a tool to shame the people from um, speaking up in contravention to what the Indian state thinks, is a regular practice. And if we look at several reports, and one that comes to mind is the report by Medicines Sans Frontières, which is a French uh, organization. They did their report on uh, sexual violence, I think, in 2010, and it said that more than, more than 15 to 16% of women had been assaulted at some point. Um, and it's alarming because if you look at rural Kashmir, where you have women who have historically been out and who have, despite the conservative Muslim beliefs, been very active in the rural life. And then you have army, which is stationed in our forests, in our, um, in the, in the rural plain, in the rural geography of Kashmir. So, and the men who are really not in the picture there. So what you're left with is women with these armed men, right? So it's a, it's a kind of a regular, um, regular day-to-day -day scene of Kashmir rural life. And I have been to places like, if you walk, if you go to north of Kashmir, which is Kupwara district, there are villages that are, that are actually closed off by the army for the night. So at five, they will, they will lock the gates to the villages. So the villagers are made entirely dependent on the army. And then we, we don't really know what's the dynamic of the relationship between civilian and armies. So a lot of this is also used by the Indian state to say, well, we're bringing development to Kashmir. So if they are opening up a few schools or a few, um, I don't know, you know, tailor shops for women to work at. But at the same time, um, there is, there's like a zero organization of people on their own. So we don't know how they, how they really feel under such threatening militariz militarization conditions. But if we clearly look at the resistance politics of Kashmir from 1800, that is when they first came under the Dogra rule, which was in, which, uh, by the Treaty of Amritsar, I'm sure many other scholars must have talked about that. Uh, what we have seen regularly is that women have uh, outnumbered men in their enthusiasm to fight for independence. And there are possibly many explanations for why that happened. But one of the explanations was that um, throughout different movements for you know, education, movements for, for uh, development, women, women have always been over enthusiastic to participate in that. So in, uh, I mean, from what I've also heard and what I have learned in Kashmir myself is that women, women's proactive role has been to the extent where men were always disarmed by the Dogra state and the Indian state. So they were all, they always felt emasculated by the political dispensation within which they found themselves. So they were always because of the gender norms that somehow women will not be harmed by the army. They would always push women to the forefront. So when I was doing my research on the book, I actually met women who said that you know the men they were they were very weak. They wouldn't know how to. Um, go out and protest for anything. So we would always outnumber them because they thought we would not be attacked because they would think we are women so they won't touch us. 
And so that kind of uh, gendered understanding and notion of women helped them to get more education, to get more, um, to, to fare better on many indicators of life. And as we speak, we have more than 70% literacy rate in Kashmir today, and women are definitely outnumbering uh, them as we speak. Uh, so by those gendered norms in a Muslim culture, somehow women fared better and they, they kind of had a better, uh, it, it's, it's really interesting because as, as, I'm, as I'm thinking about it, it didn't work the same way in Afghanistan, but in Kashmir, it did. So the reason was also that there was a lot of understanding of um, socialist ideas and norms that mixed with the Islamic belief that if we wanted to emancipate ourselves, we needed to educate ourselves. And we shouldn't forget that in the Dogra rule, Kashmiri Muslims were not allowed to go to the school. Education was forbidden for them. So for them to gain education, to, uh, to find more progress through things that were not allowed for them was a passionate political commitment. And then women, women were outdoing in that because they understood the value of, of that. And when we see that uh, in, within the resistance struggle, what role women have played, it's, it's enormous. It's, it's not just about being mothers or fighters or being um, you know bodies that create soldiers for defense of a nation or a state but it's it's very much about being people and being themselves in there in the war so visualization of themselves as actors who can change um, the conflict so we have 19 in 1945 and 46 onwards, we have women participating in uh, Liveside Front protests in 60s, where they're arguing and articulating that why self-determination is good, and they would go from village to village and educate other women, apart from what the men were doing, which was very separate. So they would hold conferences and they would come together and they would discuss in their own mother tongue what a concept like self-determination could mean and how they should fight for that and which proved a sort of base for several other uh, political uprisings in the history. So if you look at Sheikh Abdullah's, like what I mean, I'm sure Naila Ali Khan has talked about, how his incarceration created that shift where people suddenly felt that now after he came out of the jail, people in Kashmir realized that he was no longer representing the cause of self-determination. And therefore, there needed to be something else that needed to be done in addition to, you know, the government that the Indian state has put in place. I don't know if it's making sense to you because there's so much other background. Um, so when that happened, you also saw that there were different ideological uh, waves that came in, especially in the 89, when people thought, well, we're not getting our right to self-determination it's because we are Muslim. If we were not Muslim, it would, it, it would have happened easily. So there's a sense of how Islamophobia has been directed towards the people of Kashmir and how there has been a distrust that they cannot be left independent because they're Muslims and by the very nature they are not to be trusted. Um, and this is a feeling that started to creep in, in in the 89 when there's an armed struggle. And even throughout that armed struggle, you see women are talking about Islam, which has, of course, sometimes very, very fascist representations where they can argue that, you know, Kashmir is for Muslims. Absolutely, it's not. Kashmir is for Kashmiris, and there are different religions in here, but there are Islamic thoughts like of fascistic tendencies that come and they say this. But at the same time, you see women, they're also talking about Islam, but they're talking about Islam of justice. So they talk about women's rights in Islam. So they talk about the minority rights in Islam. So they try to argue for a vision which is more pan-Kashmir, where there's inclusion and where there's, uh, where there's a possibility of living together as we have for more than 8,000 years with different kinds of you know, political, uh, political and uh, ideological beliefs. So women have 
played a role not only in participating in the resistance, but also redirecting the meaning of resistance and trying to articulate within these movements that why there was need for equality and democracy. At the same time, women have been used as bodies over which you could contest this war. So on the one side, you will have the Hindu fascist Indian forces saying, we need to save Kashmiri women. Why? I don't know whether taking them out, marrying them or whatever. On the other side, you will have the fascist tendencies in the Islam saying, we need to protect women by covering them up, shutting them out, not letting them out. And women have very meticulously fought these forces. They have been one of the biggest crusaders of, uh, against India's occupation. At the same time, they have challenged the local patriarchy uh, in terms of what comes from the Islamic churches or the mullahs or any local authorities that have demanded women to act in one way or the other. In I 80s agree. itself, you could see. In relation yeah. to that, Dr. Malik, uh, I would like to uh, briefly read uh, what you have written about this in the past. Uh, quite eloquently stated. So if I can quote, Muslim Kashmiri women are not accidental victims, but political agents in the struggle for self-determination. They are vehement opponents of patriarchy in its cultural and statist manifestation. They are participating in, in a tussle for power, political or social, which is now at the heart of the resistance movement against the Indian state. And you've also said that my wish is that more women come forward. The movement has already been transferred to the next generation, whether they like it or not. And you've called for giving Kashmiri women a tongue to tell what they have faced. So we've seen how these Kashmiri women have stepped forward in the past and over these uh, past generations and the role that they've played in, in the 1900s, in the 1990s. And now, as the situation in Jammu and Kashmir has changed and it's still undetermined what the future of Jammu and Kashmir, uh, Kashmir especially, will be, how do you think that women should step forward? Uh, I mean, women are already... So, so the resistance struggle itself has become an intergenerational baggage. It is something people learn by default when they are born as Kashmiris because they are constantly taught through cultural means how to protect this identity, which is otherwise assaulted. You know, in, you know when I was a kid, we, were, we would speak Kashmiri at home, but when we went to school, Kashmiri wasn't allowed. So we... And then you wonder, how did we manage to keep this culture, this, this language, this tradition alive, despite there being very little uh, help and very little work that has happened uh, for this culture? Uh, so one of the things is that resistance is a learned behavior. And a lot of us um, have experienced what happened in 2010. So we have seen the bloodshed, we have seen the aftermath of political violence in, in, our, in our cultures. So it's, it's kind of automatic for Kashmiris to step up to an occasion and see, okay, what is the kind of resistance that will work at this moment? So to give you a personal example, I mean, when uh, the Modi government decided to go all in on Kashmiris, just five days ahead of that, Kashmiris had already figured it out that this is going to happen. So when I spoke to my dad back home, um, and I was unaware because I live so far away, I don't know what's going on at the local, you know, the everyday Kashmiri politics. I spoke to my dad and my dad said, you know what, I bought a deep freezer. So I was like really suspicious. I'm like, why would you do that? Like Kashmir only, hardly has any summer. It's like one month or so. Why would you waste your money? And then he just gave me a smile and he said nothing. And then a few days later, when the news was all out and it was 4th of August and everything was about to shut down and I, I wanted to say them, you know, to, to take care of themselves. And I talked to my father and he said, now you know why I bought the freezer because I filled it up with food. So that's the level of preparation from ordinary people because they know how resistance consists, I mean, how it is important to resist and how 
these brutal state uh, policies and brutal repression from the state has regularly uh, made them experience the worst and they're always ready for the worst, right? So for similarly for Kashmiri women, I think after 2010, there was a universal understanding that if Kashmiris wanted to change something about their lives, collective political future, it is important that they start um, writing in English. So we have a mass of intellectual women coming out of Kashmir who are working and who are writing and who are, you know, lecturing on Kashmir, its politics and what's going on, what's wrong there. And apart from such a, such a mass like um, in intellectualization of Kashmiri political life, we also have Kashmiri women who regularly join protests and you must have seen a lot of videos where they come out in all women protests and they present their demands and they don't, they're not scared, they're not cowed down by, um, despite, the, despite the actual real consequences of militarization on their bodies and on their lives, uh, whether it's in terms of losing their family members, whether it's in terms of losing their families, the disappearing of their family members, or whether it is uh, their own lives uh, be being put at stake, despite of all of those, they regularly and vehemently come out and oppose India's brutality um, on in Kashmir. So what I'm thinking is that as we speak, Kashmir women are not in their homes, they are regularly fighting um, to be heard. And the good, the good thing, and, and I don't know if there's anything positive about the situation, except that you will find a lot of Kashmiri women, uh, writers, scholars, and people who are trying to bring attention to the problem. And that's already, uh, that's already a sort of win for Kashmiri people, because they're not sitting down, they're not, they're not just not doing anything, they're trying to be heard, they're trying to make themselves be heard. So, yeah. So, as we move to a conclusion in our conversation, Dr. Malik, I do want to ask you, on a personal note, how is the communications blockade, the blackout in Kashmir impacting you? And then, in relation to that, there is some talk that aspects of it have been lifted, but I'm hearing from a lot of Kashmiris that know the blackout is not over, it's, it's just as bad as it has been for the past several, for the past two weeks. What is your impression of that? Uh, so, so one of the things that is that must be understood about the current uh, political dispensation in India is that they regularly lie, and the media is filled with absolute lies about what's going on in Kashmir. And uh, I mean, if you remember when when there were Kashmir people were anticipating that there will be an all-out curfew and there will be uh, additional military troops being sent in. A lot of people were asking the governor of Jammu and Kashmir that whether this is true or not. So the governor of Kashmir said, this is not true, but I can't promise you what's going to happen in the future. And this is a person who is supposed to be responsible for more than 12 million people's lives, um, saying things which he's absolutely responsible to tell the people the truth. But you don't hear the truth from the current political dispensation and the media is regularly manipulated to, to, to kind of twist the facts in favor of how an Indian people want to hear it. And definitely the communication blackout is one of the most serious ones I have experienced in whole of my life. I have been in the US before in 2014 during the flood. I could not talk to my parents for about a month, but uh, but still, there was a possibility that I could gather information from other people who were going and coming in. The kind of block, blockade right now is unprecedented because they have cut out the landlines, which were the last things to go. The landlines would never be cut off. The internet would never be cut off. Um, so they have even closed off the cable network when, where people can watch TV and news. So even at some point, I have heard that people, people don't have electricity. So what we're talking about is really, really massive in terms of cutting the people out and so nobody can understand what's going on there. And also at the same time, there was a massive troop buildup happening on the line of control. 
So the government of India started with an advisory saying all the tourists should leave because there will be a terror attack. And this was the scare that was circulated. And then suddenly the troops were built in, the Kashmir people were kept quiet, so no information can come in. Our fear was that they want to go, like they want to go in, and if the Kashmir people are going to protest, they will kill a lot of people. And based on the admissions of some of the Kashmiri politicians, there was preparation for killing more than 8,000, 10,000 people. So, and at the same time, the firings on the LOC were increased. So what we've recently heard that Pakistan soldiers were killed. So there was this provocation for war. So it, it was, it is such a dangerous predicament. And I think even now Indian government would have been much happier if there was an all out war because what they want to do is they want to get rid of Kashmiris and settle the scores of having the entire Kashmir to themselves. And this is something because, I've heard multiple times from other Kashmiris that I've spoken with, the exact words they use is that they feel that the Indian government wants Kashmiri land without Kashmiris. Absolutely, and there's a reason to believe so because what, what do you make of the fact that you have even put behind the bars your own administration people. So all the major Kashmiri politicians, pro-India politicians, I'm not even talking about pro-freedom politicians because we have no idea what happened to them. But it's pro-India politicians who are under the blockade. There are notifications being sent out to change the middle rung bureaucracy, which deals with the land preservation. Right? So you have the fourth class, uh, sorry, class uh, bureaucrats who deal with land papers, accusations and stuff. And there, there, are, there are these regular notifications coming out for changing them, transferring them. Why is that happening? So there are lots of red flags about what they want to do there, right? so, which is dangerous. And it's only pointing towards um, a willingness to even go ahead with a complete genocide, but keep the land. And this is not unheard of because this has happened in many places. This is not unheard of that it can happen. And especially that's how, un I mean, a lot of Indian people would also tell you that how unconstitutional each step of this, these events has been, that it only raises alarm for the future of South Asia, not just for Kashmiris, because Kashmiris have been suffering anyway for a long time now. But this raises alarms for the peace in this region for the long time to come. Yeah. So as you look at what's happening in Kashmir now, and you think about the future of it, what is it that you think the future of Kashmir looks like? And in particular, what do you think is necessary to bring about stability and peace and prosperity to Kashmir? Um, I think this is something that should have been very obvious that both uh, Kashmir, both Kashmir's on the both sides of the line of control need to be demilitarized because it's very, very dangerous. The, the level of army and military we have in Kashmir is very dangerous. And we need to demilitarize the region. First of all, what is the purpose of a regular army being stationed against civilians? What is the purpose? So we need to articulate for a complete demilitarization of both sides. And we need to bring a political will in both the Pakistani and Indian administration to allow for Kashmiris to have their own political future where they don't continue obsessing over the territory of Kashmir with zero regard for what's happening to people there. And, and this has gone on for so long that it is absolutely atrocious that in this day and age, we are talking about whether certain people need to be heard, whether certain people have political rights or whether certain people can represent themselves. And I think Kashmiris have wisdom and have a huge tradition of um, being, political, being political as people that they can determine their future and what the international community needs to do is instead of telling India and Pakistan to resolve the issue bilaterally, 
needs to actually uh, create a representation for Kashmiris uh, within the conflict and, and understand that this is not just about a piece of land, this is about the people of Kashmir. And what makes it more difficult to have that argument is because of the colonial interests of the Indian state and the Pakistani state. Now, what I mean by that is Kashmir is a source of six major rivers that flow into Pakistan. On which India's project station, which Kashmir is the source of electricity for most, most of the northern grid in India. And so this is also about the resource of Kashmiri people. So, in, so meanwhile, we had to buy our own electricity from center in India. So this is pure colonization. This is nothing else. This is not what Kashmiris don't have any say in how their resources are used, how their, their what laws can govern their life, what politics should you know apply to them as a people, what kind of education they can get. If they have no say in any of this, what we what we're talking about is that a continuation of colonialism that was installed by the British and continued with vehement. Uh, support and with incredible, you know, incredible um, interest by both Indian, Indian Pakistani state and more so by the Indian state in, in occupied Kashmir. So the future cannot happen until and unless the world recognizes that we need to resolve this by including Kashmiris, by demilitarizing the region, and by holding a referendum. And whether it's United Nations, whether it's the International Criminal, um, sorry, International Court of Justice, Kashmiris need a representation in these institutions to be able to defend their rights. So without that, I don't see any possible uh, way of resolving this. Well, Dr. Insha Malik, I want to thank you for your time and I want to stand with you in solidarity in hoping for and working for the complete decolonization and demilitarization of both sides of Kashmir and for Kashmiri voices to be given the proper place at the table, which is the preeminent place as Kashmiris are naturally the primary stakeholders in Kashmir. Thank you so much, Peter, for having me. And this is important that I could send out this message and I would use your platform to send out this message to Kashmiri people that, uh, we are like together in this fight and this is a fair fight. It's a fight for justice and we should all be there and we would be there.